soon after the Arab states clapped their embargo and then boosted the price of oil by 400 percent, President Nixon announced the appointment of a domestic energy czar, and the American people were introduced to William E. Simon, a cyclone from Wall Street who bedazzled the Congress, the bureaucracy, and the press and got us through the winter. It isn't clear just how much he had to do with the survival of the Republic, but there is little doubt that his hyperactivity gave us a sense of motion so that when the Arabs finally ended the embargo, we were still functioning and our automobiles and factories were still purring. Unfortunately, the end of the embargo did not mean the end of $10 oil, up from two bucks only six months earlier. That continuing problem has been called by Mr. Simon, by Mr. Kissinger, by Mr. Burns, the most serious threat to American industry in American economic history. William Simon was born in New Jersey in 1927 and attended Lafayette College. He was instantly attracted to business and became a municipal bond trader and in due course a partner of Salomon Brothers in New York, where he attracted attention as a man of great decisiveness. By that time, he was asked, by the time he was asked to join the Treasury Department as Deputy Secretary, he had greatly succeeded. He sired a large family and made a small fortune which he put into a blind trust on the day he arrived in Washington. When in the final months of his administration, Mr. Nixon accepted the resignation of George Shultz, the Secretary of the Treasury, he appointed William Simon to that job, which continues to hold. It is not yet known in whom or in what proportion economic power will consolidate within the Ford administration. Meanwhile, Mr. Simon is the most active and the most conspicuous spokesman for the administration. I should like to begin by asking Secretary Simon if he is by any chance familiar with the Buckley proposal for combating the OPEC cartel. No, I'm not, uh, <laughs> Mr. Buckley. <laughs> well, would you like to hear about it? Yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed I would. <clears throat> well, the notion, the notion is that the cartel's activities uh, can be viewed and are justly viewed as a form of economic warfare. Since everybody agrees that uh, $11.75 is not a free market price of oil, under the circumstances, those who charge us that much money for oil are in fact attempting to take advantage of us. Us, when I say us, I mean us, uh, West Germany, Italy, Japan, so on. The world the world, <clears throat> and that under the circumstances, discriminatory countermeasures would appear to be in order, but intelligently deployed, they would aim at um, reducing the price of oil by tending to put pressure on people to break away from the cartel. Now, a few months before the Yom Kippur War broke out, Professor Adelman of MIT suggested that we receive sealed bids from the OPEC uh, countries and that we would commit ourselves to taking the lowest of the, the bids, sort of a Dutch auction approach. <clears throat> My suggestion would be to double the excess over the market price in the form of an import tax, the purpose of which would be to atomize the cartel and simultaneously to give the American taxpayer the satisfaction of knowing that uh, he was punishing pro tanto those who sought to punish us. Is that a feasible approach? Well, I hadn't, uh, unfortunately, heard that approach before. Parts of it I had. The import uh, portion of it on the seal bids, uh, we did look uh, at a proposal very similar to Maury Edelman's, uh, and indeed continue to review all of the options. What our first policy choice to deal with the terribly high price of Arab oil was uh, an attempt at uh, non-confrontation, if you will, with these nations, an attempt to illustrate to them that maximization of price uh, for any commodity that clearly $11 plus oil was not in their best economic self-interest, arguing it from, from their point of view. And I think that the response of the consumer world to the price of oil presently, which has been a drastic reduction in, in consumption, has placed pressures on these prices. Now, these pressures, uh, obviously, uh, in the short run, due to the 
OPEC ability to cut production uh, are not going to work as fast as people like. But uh, we today have shut in capacity in the OPEC nations of eight and a half million barrels a day, and that's quite substantial. And if we continue to put in programs of a cooperative nature among the consuming nations, uh, we can put even greater pressure on the prices. And from, a, from an economic point of view, uh, the price of oil uh, will come down. And it's always misinterpreted when I make that statement that it's going to come down instantly. This is, a, this is in the one to three year time frame. Well, of course, this, this is a political question yeah, as well as an economic sure. question. And in many, many facets of it, it's more of a political question than it <coughs> is an economic one. I, I, I agree that it is. And I always, I, and, I, and I subscribe, as I think you do, to the notion that there ought not to be economic interferences with the free flow of traffic among nations, uh, except in so far as there is a political motivation. Uh, otherwise, uh, you have a form of protectionism. I most certainly which is subscribe certainly to that. Yes. Now, what I want to ask you is this: uh, Isn't it in the, isn't it to the benefit of the United States to uh, take advantage of those differences uh, in the domestic economies of the OPEC states, which we can, uh, which which by discriminating among them give us an opportunity to deal differently with different states. I give you two examples. Venezuela needs us to sell as much of its oil as it, ca as it can. Uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't really quite need to quite uh, uh, that much because uh, Venezuela needs all the capital and can readily absorb all of the capital that it can uh, uh, import through the use of dollars earned, Saudi Arabia reaches a point in which it's the, uh, a dollar is simply redundant. Now, that being the case, ought there to be a policy that distinguishes between the temptations that are put in the way of Venezuela and those put in the way of Saudi Arabia? Well, this can be, can be argued. There is no doubt about that. But it has uh, political, worldwide costs, the adoption of a policy such as that. What we've attempted to do, recognizing the differences uh, in the societies that we're dealing with and recognizing the needs of these societies uh, as they begin to look beyond their day of oil primacy, is to work in a cooperative fashion with them, as we have been doing in the instance of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, as they attempt to industrialize uh, and diversify their economies. And I think that uh, Saudi Arabia, in particular, the, the statements that uh, King Faisal as well as Minister Yamani have made and uh, continue to make relative to a reduction in the world price of oil being in the best interests of producers as well as consumers uh, show you that, uh, that they are responsible people and desire a, a market price of oil rather than the controlled price by a group that controls 70 percent <coughs> of today's proven reserves but are only going to have 70 percent of the world's proven reserves for a relatively short period of time because the activity that's going on outside of these OPEC nations now is startling. Few people recognize the fact that in the past year we have discovered, this is non-OPEC sources and non-United States, we've discovered 30 billion barrels of oil and that translates into about 13 to 13 and a half million barrels a day production before 1980 doesn't include our outer continental shelf, which potentially has 100 billion barrels. Um, these, that is just an estimate. Our Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which will br be bringing 2 million barrels a day of oil into the West Coast before the end of this decade. <coughs> Further exploration on the North Slope, our petroleum reserve number four. We can meet this not only with a demand response, but a supply response, and take into consideration the joint commissions and economic cooperation that we exercise with, uh, with other countries on a country-by-country -country basis. Yeah, but uh, uh, isn't it also extremely tempting for the Persian Gulf states to take advantage of the tight situation uh, at the moment to take simultaneously into account the uselessness of the redundant dollar and to start giving us oil in exchange for oil in the ground somewhere else. Take, for instance, the North Sea uh, reserves of England. England's having a hell of a time financing a pipeline. Now, it was recently 
observed by a British banker, an American British banker, Mr. Galbraith, no relation, uh, that uh, uh, probably the only way in which uh, England will come up with the necessary financing for this would be to sell oil in the ground in return from in return for delivered oil from uh, Saudi Arabia now. This would have the effect of extending on over into the next decade the OPEC uh, leverage if it were done on a wide enough scale. Is that taken sufficiently into account in your thinking? That is taken into account. I've seen no evidence that, uh, even though I've seen that proposal suggested, that, that uh, anyone uh, embraced that proposal. But most certainly it's taken into account. And the North Sea is just one of several of the large discoveries <coughs> in the past year. Well, if, uh, if, you, if you do find in the Persian Gulf states a glut of dollars, which is now widely predicted, if you find a diminished economic opportunity for investing those dollars, either as a result of a worldwide recession or as a result of an inhospitality to the notion that uh, McDonald's hamburger stand should be owned by Sheik Yamani, uh, isn't it likely that uh, the fine economic minds that we are slowly and painfully coming to recognize are being trained in the Persian Gulf areas are likely to decide that the best form of future investment is extraterritorial oil. Well, I must admit that I have some disagreement with your, with your basic premise. Uh, number one, the policy of the United States continues to be uh, encouraging the investment uh, of the Arab dollars in uh, in real estate and broad diversification of, uh, of equity in our industry, as long as it's not in industry of a national security category. And we have Defense Department and SEC and antitrust and uh, various regulatory bodies to protect uh, against uh, antitrust or national security. But uh, there's been some misunderstanding recently on the, the turn down with the, with the Lockheed Corporation, et cetera, as to what our policy is. And uh, we continue to re-enunciate this policy that we wish to encourage them uh, to participate in investment. Uh, that's what world trade is, a free flow of goods and services and, and money. So you, would have, you, you as Secretary of the Treasury would have no objection, let's say, to a flow of uh, two or three hundred billion dollars of uh, Persian Gulf money over the next four or five years? I think that's uh, slightly higher than... Yeah, it's uh, pretty high, but that's why I asked. Than, because I don't, see, I don't see that as a potential. Uh, mm -hmm. Indeed, there are many who thought that the United States would receive 70 to 75 percent, which is what you're suggesting, mm -hmm. of the surplus funds. And uh, the United States could not accept that much because we cannot accept the burden of recycling. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these funds, which indeed they must be recycled. So there is a natural economic limit to what they can invest. Yes, and, and there again, that's an initial judgment uh, on the part of the financial and economic people. Uh, I consider somewhere around a third to 35 percent is a reasonable amount for our economy to absorb properly without having to to but take on the test percent of, what? of the surplus funds of the OPEC mm -hmm. nations. Mm -hmm. Now, what have we gotten so far? Well, thus far, we've gotten about 23 or 24 percent uh, of the surplus funds. But each year, depending on the country there again, because uh, Algeria and Venezuela, as you correctly said, and Iran have the ability to absorb these funds. Uh, other countries, Saudi Arabia, initially do not. Although their budget this year is $13 billion for their new fiscal year versus $25 billion in revenue. It's a literal explosion. And I will suggest that these countries are going to be able to absorb the funds internally uh, at a much faster pace. The real danger occurs on the transfer of real resources uh, and technology in the future. And any transfer of this size has tremendous political and economic ramifications that uh, we could draw many scenarios of uh, what, would, what would indeed occur in this world if this were to continue for five or six or seven years or for any prolonged period. Well, do I understand you then to be saying that by, by doing nothing, uh, we are on the side of economic gravity? No. Uh, that economic gravity is really working in we such are not a doing, way. We're, we are not doing nothing. That, well, is, the, well, that is the point. I, I know that we're not doing what you want us to do. Uh, I, thought, I thought it extremely poignant when you said the other day to somebody, what do you mean I've got no 
oil policy. I have recommended 22 times to two presidents of the United States that we oh, have a tax on well, I was just I was just being <laughs> facetious. You know, I do hold a, a record of some sort, and that, uh, but that's an, but that's another story. As far as the recycling of the funds are concerned, there are many mechanisms that have been created. We've recommended a new one as a supplemental safety net, but not to deal purely and simply with the financial aspects of the price of oil. It must tie in the country who joins his energy policy and his economic policy. And this makes good sense because we've been preaching uh, for the past year that we cannot separate energy policy and economic policy uh, in your domestic economy. Well, as they fuse uh, in America is not necessarily as they fuse in Saudi Arabia. That is to say, uh, our hierarchical table is different from theirs. And uh, the job of the statement, of course, is to look for points of congruity. But there aren't points of congruity as we project the existing situation, uh, are there? As far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, uh, having made a visit over there and having met with their ministers uh, on several occasions here in the United <coughs> States over the past two years, uh, I am impressed uh, with the fact that they are a responsible, intelligent, and highly conservative people. They recognize immediately that it's in their best interest to have a, a stable, healthy, viable world economy and financial system. And they will and have invest their money according to those principles. Uh, and that's exactly what they're doing right now. And we have received in this country uh, slightly in excess of uh, ten billion dollars of OPEC revenues thus far this year, uh, which about approximately half have been invested in government securities and the rest in commercial banks and other other sources. Freeing up American capital to pursue uh, other capital ventures, you mean? Yes, that's, uh, <coughs> that's one very real way to look at it. Uh, we yeah, must remove our federal government. Uh, you get on my favorite subject of fiscal responsibility and uh, the massive deficits that we've created, which have compounded our problem and put us into this mess we're in today, right at the, at the very beginning, followed by the creation of money, additional money supply to finance these deficits. And uh, we have encroached uh, to a tremendous extent on the capital markets. In 1973, uh, the U U.S. Treasury and its sponsored agencies uh, accounted for 63 percent of the money borrowed in those markets. Well, who becomes the disadvantaged when your government operates in such an irresponsible fashion? I think it's just terrible. Well, you're using catnip with me when you talk about uh, fiscal responsibility, so don't apologize for it. <laughs> but I would like to ask you this in your conversations, for instance, with these leaders in the Persian Gulf. Uh, do you go so far as to say to them, look, uh, insofar as the United States suffers from this huge uh, uh, outlay for imported oil, it necessarily worsens its inflationary situation. And it sets up domestic pressures for a reduction in unnecessary spending. And that which uh, most people uh, automatically seize on to reduce is the defense establishment. And to the extent that we proceed to dismantle our defense establishment, we are dis dismantling precisely the only thing that you can ultimately rely on to keep that oil yours rather than somebody else's. Now, does their thinking extend that far when they look into the future? These are, are extremely intelligent men, uh, all with uh, uh, degrees. I almost said that they're, they're all American educated. That doesn't make them extremely intelligent men, but they are, uh, they are experts in their particular fields, and uh, you don't have to really draw them pictures uh, about this. Of course, we have very frank and open conversations. Basically, the, the Arab nations in general, and uh, Saudi Arabia in particular, and Kuwait, are fundamentally friends of the United States, and they always have been. And as I said a little while ago, uh, King Faisal and Prince Humani and others over there at the senior level of government recognize that a lower oil price is in the interest of the rest of the world. They're doing a great deal more damage to certainly the lesser developed countries, which uh, this oil price is completely devastating. <coughs> and then the longer it lasts, as it works its way up the ladder to the stronger countries, from the weaker to the stronger, the more damage it does. And, uh, and they truly recognize that, yes. 
Well, you say they truly recognize that, but they seem to have an extraordinary fortitude in enduring it. Uh, th there, is, there is no uh, obvious measure that they have taken to grant uh, relief to those countries that they have uh, uh, victimized. Well, thus far, the relief has come in the form of, uh, of loans to many of these nations uh, and financial assistance. But of course, we continue to argue for the lower price being the only true relief. And you must remember that uh, it is a cartel that <coughs> has agreed to all of these steps. And uh, let's say perhaps Rome wasn't built in a day. This, uh, this oil price has only been in existence for a year, Yeah. even though that's a year <coughs> too long. Well, now, you, you're talking about their, in, their intelligence and their lack of insularity, which um, I'm, I'm glad you've stressed it because I think uh, it is correct that most, most Americans think that uh, the people who run those countries are, simply don't know about uh, uh, other worlds and uh, other cultures. As a matter of fact, I think it was the American delegates who got up on the floor of the United Nations and wondered aloud why the Israelis and the Muslims couldn't settle their differences like good Christian gentlemen. But uh, <laughs> since, since they are presumed to be intelligent, they must know what anybody who reads uh, Jane's fighting ships knows, which is that we no longer really are in a position uh, assertively to defend our interests in the Eastern Mediterranean, and that our interests are really coterminous with their interests uh, in any showdown with the Soviet Union. Now, what I'm asking is, do they, in their thinking, relate uh, the growing indifference of the United States to the exercise of our imperial responsibilities to America's growing sense of frustration as a result of our apparent inability to control inflation? Well, they are as concerned and talk quite often about the ability of the United States as well as, well as the rest of the industrialized world uh, to control inflation. Uh, and, of course, some over there, uh, not, again, Saudi Arabia, use the current high price of oil uh, as just a response to what indeed has been going on with all of the commodities they must import where that argument is completely fallacious because uh, on a trade-weighted basis, uh, the imports uh, into most of those countries uh, are about one quarter, one twenty percent uh, of what the cost of, of oil. There's a five to one ratio, in other words, that oil is higher than the prices on a trade-weighted basis of their imports. Uh, and Saudi Arabia recognizes that, other countries, and would agree with it. Other countries uh, indeed disagree with it, but they weigh very heavily the political ramifications worldwide in their decisions. And as I said a little while ago, this is uh, in many instances, uh, perhaps <coughs> most, a political problem uh, rather than an economic and financial. It translates itself into an economic and financial problem of immense proportions if allowed to continue. Are the states in question signatories to the anti-proliferation treaty? Now that I do not know. Is it conceivable that um, let's say, f looking forward five or six or seven years, uh, looking forward, let's say, to a, uh, a democratic sweep that calls, among other things, for an effective uh, reduction of American military power to a sort of a fortress Gibraltar uh, concept. Uh, is it conceivable that the Persian Gulf states could develop uh, a convincing deterrent through the purchase of American uh, military materials, including nuclear materials? I really don't um, pretend to be an expert in that area. That would be more appropriate to ask Jim Schlesinger and, of course, Henry Kissinger. Uh, but I have a great deal of trouble, uh, regardless of what man um, is in the White House in 1977, uh, that that scenario that you outlined is correct. Uh, uh, just a cursory analysis of our defense budget today versus what it was seven or eight years ago and what our commitments are as far as the next few years are concerned in, in real <coughs> dollars. You can see that our defense budget in real dollars is below what it was uh, in 1968 
and that there is no way that we can allow the United States to become a second-class power. Uh, and my goodness, I refuse to believe that that wouldn't be instantly recognized uh, and is, a, is certainly a nonpartisan thing by the gentleman that sits in the White House. No, well, you, you say that in the spirit of Yankee Doodle Dandy, and, and, I, and I agree. And the nap behind my neck arises in patriotic harmony with your own. But the point of it is that uh, uh, anybody who makes projections and is as intelligent as you say these people there are, uh, is capable of basic extrapolations. The fact of the matter is that the chief of naval operations, uh, who as recently as six years ago, told the President of the United States in a crisis situation that we had, in his judgment, 70 percent control of the East Mediterranean situation, has now reduced that figure to 30 percent. Now, there is nothing in prospect to change that. And I'm saying, if you are dealing with the Arabs in the long term, mustn't you deal with them either in such a way as to give them <coughs> grounds to believe that we will be there to defend their interests in the Middle East, or that they will have to do it themselves. That is certainly a very, a very strong reason why, as I said a few minutes ago, we cannot allow the United States to become a second-class power and have no intention of it. And <coughs> president Ford has reiterated that on many occasions since he became our president. Well, there was, you know, there was a guy who ran for senator from New, from New York State who got 40 percent of the vote, uh, who simultaneously appealed to the Israeli lobby. Um, and uh, asked for a 25 percent reduction, 25 billion dollar reduction in the defense establishment. So people who desire, on the one hand, uh, uh, that America be able to discharge its military responsibilities, do not necessarily want to make the sacrifice to maintain a military plant that makes this possible. These are paradoxes with which we have lived before. Yes, indeed, and uh, we would all agree that there. There is a clear danger of that happening, but, uh, but I think on reasonable explanation and realization, again, of the man that's sitting in the Oval Office in 1977, uh, he will click quickly perceive, as uh, presidents of our great country do, where their <coughs> first responsibility lies, because it goes well beyond military capability in its purest sense in the definition of military. It is, it is widely... Um uh, alleged that the existence of Israel is the principal source of our difficulty in, in the Middle East. I, I have myself rejected this analysis. I wonder if you reject it, and I if share, so why. I share your rejection entirely. I why? Think that, why do you reject it? I think that Israel and the, the very presence of Israel, uh, the growth of Israel since the end of World War II, the, the, the prodigy uh, then they are the economic prodigy of, of all the nations of the, of the free world and its protection and its ability to grow in peace. Uh, that should be a prime concern for, for we in the United States. Well, I, I, <clears throat> the people I'm talking about are not criticizing uh, Israel's achievements. They're criticizing the fact <coughs> that its existence, as they put it, uh, brought on uh, a united uh, Arabia with us as its uh, victims, that their discovery of oil as a weapon of blackmail would not have been discovered in the absence of that particular catalyst. Do you think it would have been discovered Isn't that anyway? something? I, I, I reject that notion completely. Tell me why. Uh, well, I, I just think that there are other considerations. Uh, this, this cartel was formed in, uh, I guess, 1962, the OPEC cartel. And but I not think, exploited. Oh, not exploited. Uh, uh, and they learned uh, about the weapon called oil, uh, but rather belatedly, really not until uh, last year when they perceived uh, the full effect that, a, that an effective embargo could have on the world because <coughs> the economics of oil were different. 10 and 12 years ago when the world had a surplus uh, away from the OPEC nations. And so for a time they can uh, exact their economic blackmail through this, uh, through this method, uh, but only for a time. So but I reject the notion that that is a, a related development, mm -hmm. that uh, 
uh, you think the development to... of their oil and uh, fine, the embargo was pu put in for political reasons and supposedly would be again for the same reasons if indeed uh, hostilities broke out. Uh, but that is a different set of circumstances, in my judgment, to why the oil was developed and, and subsequent events. So that your, your feeling is that if Israel didn't exist, essentially the problems would not change as between us and the Persian Gulf states and their extortionary well, oil I think, pricing. I think that that could be part of the reason that oil prices are where they are today, but a, in my judgment, a very small part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, oil prices were quadrupled for lots of reasons. Uh, and as I say, I consider the Israeli reason as a, as a dis remote factor. All right, let me ask you this. Since you acknowledge that some states that sell us oil need our dollars much more than other states that sell us oil, why don't we favor in our purchase plans those states that uh, need our dollars in order to get corresponding concessions from them? Well, the difficulty that I see with that, and there again, I'm, hearing, I'm, I'm, hearing, a, I'm hearing a proposal for the, for the first time. The, the difficulty with that is that oil, oil, like money being a fungible mm -hmm. entity, uh, would find its way to other markets anyway. And to be able to trace oil, and I tried that last winter, uh, that was embargoed where it would disappear from a warehouse into a refinery and back out again and onto tankers. and. Uh, and then off to other ports. Like I the stuff that gets to Rhodesia, you mean? We would, we would never know exactly uh, through the transfer of using these discriminatory measures against other countries uh, uh, which oil on transshipment we were finally receiving because it's swappable, and it's swappable just through bills of lading, isn't it? Have you consulted scientists about this? Is there no way of uh, impregnating the oil with some uh, telltale uh, fingerprint? You mean oil from Venezuela yeah. is blue and the other is that green? Kind of and no, I hadn't, I must admit. But there again, I'm just hearing something the first time. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, uh, if, 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 if it's true, as I take it it is, that the places like Nigeria and Iran and uh, Indonesia and Venezuela and, and Canada need our dollars much more than, say, Kuwait, and uh, Saudi Arabia, it would make sense, assuming it could be done, would it not, to uh, patronize them with the end in mind of getting symmetrical concessions, a lowering in price. Well, there again, you're, you're suggesting that one nation in a group, the OPEC group, uh, yeah. break away from the OPEC group. Yeah. Uh, because you're giving them these so-called concessions, and um, I don't know, A, what concessions you're talking about. Uh, <coughs> some have suggested we barter our wheat uh, or grain for, for the oil. Well, that's suggesting we sell our wheat and grain under the world yes. market prices, and they sell their oil under their world market prices. Well, Either way, it becomes a, another large government subsidy, doesn't it? Uh, because we oh, must yeah. oh, yes. no subsidize. <coughs> uh, sure. Uh, so you could just, in the first instance, subsidize the oil imports that come in, uh, right. Right. and and reduce the cost to the consumer if that's if that's what you wish to do. Mm -hmm. Well, we we, we now have a flat eighteen cents uh, a barrel import duty. Uh, s s suppose we had a flat uh, five dollar a barrel import duty but uh, reduce that import duty uh, per tanto uh, as you reduce the price at which the oil is made available to American importers. And then you made it their responsibility to go over there and bring the oil so that you, you could say to Exxon, all right, you go and buy uh, X amount of oil from Venezuela, and if you can show us receipts <coughs> that you bought it at uh, $8 instead of $11, which is what they're charging in, in Arabia, we will give you a $2 rebate on that import duty. This is not lacking feasibility, is it? They would then be responsible for importing the oil. They've got the tankers and so on and so forth. Uh, that, is a, that is a possibility, but you're suggesting again that Venezuela uh, would violate uh, an agreement that they have but, uh, Absolutely. on the, on um, the selling price. Am, as Professor Edelman suggests, in a minute. Yes. And you don't think they would? I don't uh, think am so. Am I asking you to say something undiplomatic because I don't want to do that? No, uh, I just think it's uh, practically speaking at this point in time, uh, you're suggesting that one person or one country rather, or several countries, leave the OPEC organization. 
Well, I'm, 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 suge I'm suggesting that uh, if you've got, as you just finished telling us, eight million barrels a day of excess oil sitting in the ground, uh, it's going to hurt some countries more than others to it, the ones who need to sell all their oil. Now, if we discriminate there is, there is impartially no against them, we are in effect discriminating most acutely on those who need to sell their oil and most acutely. If we, if we as a world uh, discriminate uh, impartially against them, uh, rather than confrontationally, if you will, by these uh, non-defined concessions that you speak of that we're going to be giving them, and I still don't it isn't clear to me what these concessions are. If we can reduce significantly, whether it's three or four million barrels a day, in excess of what we're doing today, this is the consuming nations of the world. This puts additional pressure uh, on the price of oil because they must cut production further and they must make agreed production cuts. Uh, uh, and how that will be prorationed isn't quite clear to yes, me. Yes, but, but to cut production, say, by 5% in Venezuela could absolutely bankrupt it in terms of their uh, capital ambitions. To put a 5% reduction on Saudi Arabian oil is simply, it's not even one less tent. Uh, uh, it may be just one less island off Georgia that they buy. And uh, it's, 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 my interest is that you haven't orchestrated or appear not to have orchestrated a series of pressures that give us that uh, uh, ingenuity of performance which we need when we are handling something that presents itself to us as a monolith. Well, of course, the one important thing to understand about the whole subject of oil and economic policy as it deals uh, internationally is that I don't think that there is a more sensitive, more delicate issue uh, in the world today. And it would be improper at best uh, for myself or Secretary Kissinger, who work very hard on these issues, uh, to be announcing policies constantly. And as a result, we have been accused incorrectly uh, in the past year of not doing many of the things that we were exactly doing. Oh, well, I'm glad and, to you say that. And that's the, and the point, that's really and the what point, I wanted you to say. And the, and the point is that uh, <clears throat> if uh, we announced intentions uh, as one of the leading countries in the world, uh, then uh, we could not secure the agreement that is required in, in all of these, in such a delicate area beforehand, and that's necessary. Mm -hmm. Of course, Canada announced its intention of reducing by 100,000 barrels a day their sales to us. They come and talk to us they about that. Us. They've, no, they've, no, we've had meetings with Canada in the last year on this problem and, uh, and I mean, all that surprise on the face of Kissinger and all those people was feigned well I think perhaps the timing uh, the timing of their announcement uh, came as a surprise to some but uh, it, it, I don't think it was a surprise to Henry at all mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. they've discussed this they've got a very they've got a very severe problem in Canada and one that I rather believe that uh, that we'd act the same way the Canadians uh, have an export tax and we criticize their export tax. Well, I must admit that I don't believe we should criti uh, criticize their export tax. They're matching the world price of oil through an export tax uh, because they are exporting oil from the central portion of their country and importing it from the East Coast and uh, uh, attempting to use common sense and understanding this country that we live in. If we were exporting oil from California and importing it uh, from New Jersey, then there would be something that would equalize this uh, done in our Congress, why it's only fair. So now what they're doing is building a Montreal-Sarnia pipeline, which for the first time will be able to deliver the oil from west to east in Canada, and as a result, they're phasing out of our, our oil imports to our Midwest, uh, but doing it in a manner, and this is done after close consultation with us, that won't be too disruptive as we bring on additional supplies in this country. And I believe they're going to cooperate completely. I, I've met with them three times on this subject in the past three months. Well, yes, and I think that they're perfectly entitled to look after their own strategic requirements. Yes. <clears throat> but it's also, it's also true that you will sell uh, your oil for the highest price that you can get for it, and that they piggyback very rapidly on the OPEC increase. And in the course of doing so, I think you might say that they were guilty of a little historical profiteering well, uh, this is the one disagreement that I have with them, that for years uh, 
they had the benefit of import of exporting their oil to us uh, at a higher than world price because we were controlling our oil through the quota yeah. system at a high price. So they had that benefit uh, of three dollar plus oil while it was much cheaper when it was coming in from the Arab countries and elsewhere and they should be taking that into consideration now and conversely we should be getting a a slight break from yeah. oil imports from them. Yeah. Uh, our arguments on that remain quite inconclusive <laughs> up to this point, however. Mr. Taylor Branch is from Harper's Magazine, Mr. Branch. Uh, Secretary Simon, I would imagine that there must be many other uh, raw materials and commodities than oil in the world um, to which the same principle of the oil cartel might well apply. Tin, bauxite, I don't know how many other raw materials that are primarily produced in three or four or five, six countries. Is there any evidence that the, uh, the same principles of the oil cartel are or are about to be applied to other raw materials? We have a commission now on raw material and shortages, including uh, congressmen, senators, uh, and the executive branch of government that is uh, doing a study on exactly this issue. Now, all of our studies on the specifics, whether it's bauxite or tin, or lead vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in the area of oil right now uh, show us that clearly the same dangers do not exist. Um, the world uh, relies to such a tremendous degree on oil for its energy. The world as a whole relies on oil for about 66 percent of its energy requirements. On oil and natural gas, the United States alone depends 77 percent. Now this is an extraordinary high percentage for any commodity as critical to one's economy as energy. And we only need note what happened when we were cut off two and a half million barrels a day last winter to our economy. Uh, two and a half million barrels a day out of a consumption at that time of something in excess of 17, 17 and a half million barrels a day. Uh, sounds small, but sounds it's critical. Sounds small, but it's, but it's <clears throat> critical because People are beginning to realize that oil isn't just what goes in your automobile. It's, um, it's almost everything you touch during the course of the day, from the steering wheel in your car to your plastic cup to your toothbrush, uh, through petrochemicals, through fertilizers. Uh, uh, it, it, it's just well, all inclusive. It now, what I'm, what I'm saying is now as we move to other commodities, there are substitutes. But the substi substitutes for, for bauxite called alumina and alumina is, is uh, more plentiful here in the United States. It's a matter of price. Uh, it costs more to convert uh, alumina, but uh, there's a ceiling on what they can raise the bauxite to, to where it becomes productive to produce our alumina. Also, uh, you know, when you look at the percentage uh, of all of these other commodities, as far as the economic utilization of same in our economy, it's, it's small. It's going to have an economic impact, there's no doubt about that, and many of the prices that are being raised in all of these other commodities are being raised uh, by these countries to pay for the oil that they must import. And so it's just a, it's a, it's a chase your tail So the syndrome. same thing is happening with other commodities, it just yes, won't be but a not serious. Yes, but not to yeah. the extent, no. Okay. no. Ms. Uh, Judith Miller is from the Progressive Magazine, Ms. Miller. Mr. Simon, several American companies are planning rather expensive gas and oil deals with the Soviet Union. And under the current plans, uh, XM, <coughs> and the Exim Bank and American banks will loan the Soviet Union the money to develop uh, the infrastructure for developing their oil and gas in exchange over a 20 or 30 year period, Americans to receive gas and oil. Number one, does it do us any good to transfer a reliance on uh, Arab oil to the Soviet oil, and number two, what mechanisms do you have in the Treasury for evaluating the political impact of such prospective deals? Well, uh, as chairman of this of this commission that works on east-west trade with the U.S. and USSR, that's a very comprehensive question, and several parts of it that you stated as fact is not clear to me. Um, Number one, before we can make any arrangements with a foreign country on bringing natural gas in, uh, it must be passed by the Federal Power Commission and they must rule on the price. Uh, it's a regulated entity. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the oil we'll comes... Rule on the price we pay for it? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And as far as the oil that's brought in, that is brought in by 
private companies uh, at a competitive price or they don't bring it in uh, because they're not going to make any arrangements uh, with a foreign country to bring oil in uh, they if, can't if they can't sell it. Now, <clears throat> is it in our best interest, let's ask our first question, to explore uh, North Star and Yakutsk, which are the potential uh, two potentials over there for oil and natural gas as well as Sakhalin and, and the others. Well, the price of oil in 1980, I guess we could get uh, as many differences of opinion around here uh, on that subject. Uh, I happen to think it'll be substantially lower by 1980. That is Bill Simon's judgment. But how is it going to be, on the, on the supply side alone, going to be substantially greater through bringing in more supply? So the fact that uh, we assist technologically uh, and with our equipment, and that's good for jobs in the United States to export the technological equipment uh, and the, uh, all the rigs, et cetera, when et cetera. When there's a that, shortage in this yeah, country? Yeah, but by the time, by the time that, uh, that arrangement, if and when it's made, uh, mm -hmm. there will be no shortage any longer because you're talking about several years. We haven't even gone into the economics of the issue of uh, whether or not there is any natural gas and oil in the ground there and what the cost is to bring it up. But so all of that has to be assessed uh, before we can even begin to have an intelligent discussion of whether it's in anybody's best interest, but it's clearly in the world's best interest to have additional hydrocarbon deposits. Whether, whether Russia would sell those hydrocarbon deposits to Europe uh, or to the United States or to many consuming countries in the world, uh, it would clearly bring on more supply. And that is going to mean uh, a lower price for world oil. Mr. Frank Donatelli is with Young Americans for Freedom. Mr. Donatelli. Mr. Secretary, already certain individuals are saying that the administration is becoming more concerned about a possible recession as opposed to the inflation that we now have. I think we can see the, the different ways of dealing with both situations in President Ford, number one, calling for a balanced budget, but secondly, also advocating a public works program. Now, from your point of view, what should be the proper thrust at this point for the administration? Which should have priority, dealing with inflation or recession? And secondly, are, do you share President Ford's enthusiasm for the Public Works Program? I realize that politically it, it makes good sense, but many people, such as Milton Friedman, have argued that it doesn't make much sense economically. Well, um, you said a possible recession, and I'd like to answer that first. We, in my judgment, uh, have been in a recession, and we are in a recession. And it obviously, uh, we're in a deteriorating economic situation. We forecast that uh, this quarter will be uh, one of negative growth, and so will the first quarter of uh, 1975. And we'll begin to see progress uh, on the inflation rate toward the end of the first quarter and the beginning of the second quarter of 75. And uh, we'll be pulling out of this, uh, assuming we don't do anything silly and continue to do what's right. Uh, sometime in the third quarter, you're going to begin to see us return to on the positive growth trend. Now, what was the, there was another first part of your first question. Uh, which <laughs> the I first part of my first question was, what is the great danger at this point? Is it necessary to you know, deal more with recession we as get, opposed to We inflation? get into this uh, semantical argument about inflation and recession. Inflation and recessions are an integral part of the same malaise, and we must deal with, with both of them simultaneously. You know, if we were dealing with just a single problem of inflation or a single problem of recession, our policies could be very straightforward. We could have expansionary policies for recession and contractionary demand restraint programs for inflation, and in a very short period of time, you'd see results. Well, uh, we're dealing with double-digit inflation right now that is primarily responsible for the recession we've got. Just take the two major sectors, housing and consumer spending. It's double-digit inflation that caused the financial instability that sent our housing industry into a tailspin. It frightened and confused the American people and sent it to the, the lowest consumer spending in, in history. So both these have to be dealt with at the same time recognizing, and this is where, unfortunately, all of us in our impatience to solve a problem, we must realize there is no instant solution, that this problem took years of irresponsible fiscal and monetary policies, not to mention the special factors of food and oil and the two devaluations of the dollar and the simultaneous boom in all the industrial nations. But those special factors, they pass through an economy. And once they're through, ordinarily, the inflation rate would recede. 
This time it's not going to recede to a level that you and I would consider acceptable due to these irresponsible policies that I talked about, massive budget deficits in 13 of the past 14 years that have sent your Treasury Department into the capital markets to the extent that I mentioned before. Uh, why this created tremendous demand for, for goods and services and, uh, and upward pressure on our interest rates. And more importantly, it undermined the confidence of the American people in their government's ability to, to run their economy properly. So what we must understand, it's going to take us time to work our way out of this. We must begin by controlling the explosion in federal expenditures and moderate the growth in our monetary expansion recognizing at the same time that we have to take care of those people who, bear a, who are going to bear a disproportionate burden of the, of the cost, which is the unemployed. And, and that is why, and I truly support the, the program of unexpanded unemployment benefits and public service employment to, to assist these people during this temporary period. And it is temporary because the alternative is even higher inflation and higher unemployment in the future. Well, is it your point that the cost of a public works program is sufficient to take uh, the pain out of the unemployment is not in and of itself going to distort the objective of a more balanced budget? No, it is not. Uh, we can at the same time uh, work toward uh, a control in the growth of the expenditures. And that is the secret because obviously during a, a negative growth, no growth, and then slow growth economy, our revenues decline. And this makes, uh, gives our ability to, co to bring the budget into balance if it were desired, and it wouldn't be this year for econ sound economic reasons. Uh, it makes it uh, extremely difficult, if not impossible. But what we can do and is control the explosion, as I say, in expenditures. And that is why, you know, the $4.7 billion the President just sent up for referrals, uh, deferrals and rescissions to the Congress, well, that's $4.7 billion. But next year it turns into $7 billion and $8 billion. And the following year, uh, if history is any guide, $10 billion and $12 billion because supplementals are constantly voted to all of these programs. And then they become locked into the point where uh, today 75% of our budget is le has been legislated. Where 35 percent, government at all levels, has 35 percent of the GNP. We're heading toward, toward a controlled economy, and, uh, and I am extremely concerned at the direction in this country in, in really killing the system that's given this, this great country and given the American people the greatest prosperity it's ever known. And, and somebody's going to have to begin to, to educate the people on this subject. Well, if you're saying attacking inflation will eventually, if you bring inflation under control, eventually the recession will subside. I agree with that. But there are certain people who panic, and you alluded to the temporary, uh, the temporary lag you have between bringing inflation under control on the one hand and ending a recession. There are people who panic during that time lag and advocate uh, easy money and unbalanced budgets, et cetera. And that's and what's gotten us into the mess we're in right now because I call that opportunity lost. Okay, this is something that the administration and, recognizes. And we, have a, and we have a marvelous opportunity at this time, and I hope we have the wisdom, and I believe we have the wisdom and the courage to pursue policies uh, that are not going to be, uh, per se, overly stimulative, where a year to two years from now we'll end up with even higher inflation and subsequently higher unemployment. Did Mr. Nixon insufficiently dramatize that in the last five years? Well, I think that the, the mistakes of really the past uh, ten years, in particular uh, Republican and Democrat alike in its expenditure, its fiscal and monetary policies, uh, uh, have been poor at best. Uh, Mr. Branch? Secretary Simon, there seems to have been a, a, a reversal going on in the historical attitudes of uh, big labor and big business toward free trade, which is currently an issue in Washington. Uh, I'd like to know whether you think that um, there can be a free trade majority in the Congress without the support of organized labor. Well, I think that, uh, of course, this trade bill that's being debated now and uh, hopefully will be passed before the end of the year, I think is an illustration of, uh, of our democratic system working, at least I hope it is. And uh, I think that that's exactly what we're attempting to negotiate, uh, free world trade, demonstrating that it's in everyone's economic best interest to remove all 
barriers to the, to the free moving of goods and services and uh, the strength in economies in every country. Can you demonstrate that, though, to the people whose uh, jobs are being exported? Well, we have, uh, we have protective measures in the bill which uh, are designed to protect those people during the, during the negotiations and during the phase-in of the removal of these tariff and non-tariff barriers. And this has been worked on uh, excruciatingly in the past year and a half. Uh, Ms. Miller? Yes, you've stated that there are, industri there are uh, industries in which uh, no foreign investment is permitted. Would you lift the uh, restrictions on any particular industry, in other or would you extend them to others? Would you let the Saudis, for example, buy Pan Am? Well, as far as the broad national security definition, uh, we have been mandated by Congress to conduct a study, which we're in the process of doing with the Department of Commerce right now, Commerce and Treasury, to see whether the regulations that we have in place now are comprehensive enough to protect uh, the national security interests in its broad definition uh, sufficiently. And uh, whether or not I wouldn't prejudge this study to see whether or not uh, there are others that would be added to the category or whether we would make any, any of the changes. Right now, we have pretty stringent regulations in the departments that I mentioned before. Well, uh, <coughs> is, it, um, is it your offhand feeling that in the next four or five years, there will be enough opportunities for investment to recycle those excess dollars? Oh, I most certainly do. Uh, and, and more and more, as, as people perceive what the, what the problem is, and, you know, we've had so much hysteria worldwide about so many of the crises, uh, having lived through two of them, uh, yeah. of the large one, first the energy crisis, uh, and now, of course, uh, what many perceive as a, certainly an economic crisis. Uh, you have an awful lot of things printed and a lot of words spoken uh, that aren't supported by the facts, okay. and yet they're just accepted because uh, it's bad news. Let's accept the worst, and that's what we're trying to do is, is, is all of us just, just tell it like it is, and fine, there are things that are not so good, but uh, there are things that are still pretty good. Thank you, Secretary Simon. Thank you all. Next week, Texas Senator Lloyd Benson joins Mr. Buckley. The topic, the prospects for democratic moderation. For a printed bound transcript of this program, send $1 to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. That's $1 to... Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. Production funding provided by public television stations, the Ford Foundation, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs>